The Tale of the Abyss Sibling is one of the most fascinating stories of manipulation, loss, and betrayal. And today, I want to finally, finally talk about their journey into becoming the royalty of the Abyss by looking at one of the oldest pieces of Genshin content in the game, the Battle Passes Gnostic Chorus cutscene. And before I begin with the disclaimer, can I just say I am so happy that I can finally break down this cutscene properly because I have made so many videos about the Abyss Sibling with the Gnostic Chorus in the background but I just never talked about the Battle Pass cutscene itself. I've been a massive advocate for the Lumine and Aether Battle Pass cutscene theory. This video is just me finally getting it all off my chest. Disclaimer, this is just my personal interpretation, theory, and reading of the Gnostic Chorus based on practically years of build-up and theory making. I have made numerous videos and theories on the Abyss Sibling and this is essentially an update to those older theories. But yes, this is all just a theory and not indicative of the final product. For background, if you've ever engaged with the Genshin lore and theory community, you might have heard of the absolute clusterfuck that is the Battle Pass story, and what it can all mean. These theories came from the very birth of Genshin, and when I say the very beginning, I mean the very beginning. I'm talking about the wild wild west where everyone thought that Dane and the Sustainer were siblings, and Sandrone was Lynette and Linnae. It was fascinating, to say the least. But essentially, my version of this theory is the one I've subscribed to since the very beginning and that the story of the Battle Pass is an allegorical fairy tale about Conria and the Abyss sibling, told by Venti. Warning, this video will have spoilers for the Kari Bear story quest since I'll be using the information we learned from the Archon quest to make parallels to the Battle Pass. Alright, let's go. For the purposes of this video and consistency of pronouns and titles, I will be using Lumine as my Abyss sibling and Aether as my traveler. We first begin this theory with the important observation that Venti is the one that's telling us the story to a third party. Venti is the one that's recounting this whole fairy tale about the mysterious kingdom in the heavens. The story first starts as a third person narrative up until the very end where it shifts into a second person point of view. This creates a clear connection between the significance of this fairy tale and you, whoever you that Venti is talking to, which is most likely the traveler. This already sets the tone for the rest of the analysis. Now the reason this is interesting is because in the Monsat Arkan quest, when we first tell Venti about the Abyss Princess intel we got from Kaya, Venti says he's never heard of such a thing before. Venti questions how an Abyss Princess not only exists, but also has suddenly come out of nowhere and gained authority of commanding the Abyss Order. It's a fascinating thing to note since if this is a story on how Lumine became corrupted, Venti knowing this fairy tale has deeper implications on the surface. Venti is already a suspicious character as it is, and the the possibility of him actually lying to Aether that he doesn't know who the Abyss Princess is isn't out of the picture. Another possibility though is that this story is told by Venti to Aether somewhere in the distant future, where Aether confides in Venti about his sibling. We are receiving the cutscene now as an audience because we need to get to the battle pass, but for the timeline purposes in game, what if this storytelling happens in a different time, when Venti finally gives Aether what he needs to know about Lumine's fate? All in all, Venti being the narrator gives this fairy tale much more weight than if it was just found in a book in game. Hoyo wants us to pay attention to this cutscene over and over again with each patch. Now, let's properly break down the Gnostic Chorus and how I think each part is an allegory to the story of Lumine and her descent into becoming the Abyss Princess. Remember, fairy tales don't always have to be one-to-one -one interpretations of the events. So we have that leeway when the symbolism becomes too abstract to make a concrete connection. But I'll try to get it as close as possible with supplementary evidence. Hopefully. First is the Glorious Kingdom. Venti's first line is that there was a glorious kingdom established among the heavens, but I believe that this is Conria's story, not Celestia's. This is because of two reasons. First, the depiction of the kingdom in the heavens is very different from how Celestia is normally portrayed in other allegorical works such as murals. Celestia has also hardly been referred to in stories and lore as a kingdom, oftentimes called the island in the sky, the garden, the citadel, or the city, but kingdom usually isn't a moniker for that. But but putting aside linguistic semantics since Venti could just be using it for his own artistic interpretation, the single kingdom looks much more intricate and has three stars that remind me of this mural from Surumi Island
island that are next to a massive eclipse in the eyes of the Conrians we've seen in the game. The eclipse has been a notable symbol of Conria ever since the disaster, as according to the book Breeds and Mist the Forest, the eclipse dynasty has fallen during the cataclysm. The second reason is because while Conria is known as an underground civilization, a part of me thinks that the original kingdom is suspended somewhere in the air. If Lumine's a princess of Conria, this place could be from within the castle, and thus if the moon is very up close or has fallen, the castle itself could be suspended mid-air. But this is a fairy tale, so Venti could easily just be doing some artistic mumble jumbo so that it looks cooler. I'm willing to put that on the table as well. But for the purposes of this theory, I believe that the kingdom is Conria, because that leads us to the ruler, the crowned heir, and the pearl. These three play a massive role in the overall formation of this story, and this is where I believe that Lumine's story properly starts. The crowned heir represents Lumine, not only because she's known as the Princess of Conria, but also because she's the one sent out for the duty. The ruler and the pearl is where it actually all gets interesting, because I believe that there are two important contextual distinctions that fundamentally change their symbolisms. On one hand, we have the Conrian context, the pre-cataclysm Conria. Here, the ruler symbolizes the people of Conria who put their trust in Lumine, the nobility and common folk that saw Lumine as a new strength as told by Clother in the 3.5 Archon Quest. They're the people that put their faith in the crowned heir as a new symbol of hope, thus why Lumine is depicted as a crowned heir or an important figure in the kingdom. On the other hand, the pearl is a symbol of Conria's power, might, pride, and pure state prior to the Cataclysm, a potential symbolism of the previous luminosity that the kingdom held. Here's something fascinating about the breeds amidst the forest that recontextualizes the pearl. While this pearl symbolizes it as something to be sought after, the breeds amidst the forest mentions that an atreous sun befell its kingdom, and a luminous pearl lost its glow meaning the pearl could have already existed alongside Conria's kingdom, and was significant enough to the people that it was mentioned. But then we have the Abyssal context, where the ruler could be a reference to Clother, the people who became the catalyst for the heirs seeking the Genesis Pearl that eventually led to their downfall. Clother was the one who gave Lumine the idea of the Loom of Fate, thus throwing down the first domino that toppled Lumine's inevitable allegiance to the Abyss Order. It was Clother who also eventually became the first ruler of the Abyss Order, and the pearl that he tells the sibling to seek out is a symbolism for the lost glory of the people of Conria, the last desperate call to delve into the abyss, or the kingdom of darkness, to find something that can bring back the homeland. The pearl is a symbolism for the many desperate attempts that the Conrians had after the Cataclysm, whether it be through many unknown medicines, prayers, or desperate attempts. Eventually, the pearl can also be a symbolism for the many purification attempts that the Order goes through to try and bring back the homeland. But in the end, the Genesis Pearl that the crowned heir is looking for from the Kingdom of Darkness isn't real, and that it was all just a lie that the people and the crowned heir eventually became consumed by. Because now we continue with the symbolism of the Abyss and the promise of salvation with the Pearl and the Kingdom of Darkness. When I was looking for more pearl symbolisms in real life, I found two important references that I thought would be pretty neat to share with you. From a more positive light, the pearl is a symbolism of wisdom, enlightenment, protection, and longevity, but it also symbolizes beauty and perfection. From this context, we should look at what the abyss means to the people of Conria who became the heralds and lectors of the abyss order. There was something fascinating about the abyss when we first encountered it in 3.5, and it was a strange reaction Clother had with the fortune herald. He mentioned that the creature was the perfect being, and this is where we slowly see the seeds of zealotry and praises that we would now see in the abyss lectors and heralds. The Order held the Abyss to the highest regards as a form of salvation from the curse of immortality, and when we look at the perfect creature that Clother is talking about, it makes sense. The mysterious Herald said that fate has not granted you the right to enter this place, and that fighting it became a trial of destiny. The Abyss and the power it held became the treasure that it could have promised her birth and creation to the people who became lost after the Cataclysm. Hence, Genesis. But the next symbolism of the pearl is much more in tune with the more human side. The Pearl by John Steinbeck is a story that uses the pearl as a symbolism for greed, power, and ultimately, the delusion and desperation of a man who has nothing. All in all, the pearl can theoretically be a symbolism for both the beauty of the abyss and the lies and dangers that lurk beneath it, the mysterious hidden strength that mesmerized the order, and eventually, Lumine, because in the story, the crowned heir was eventually tricked, just as how Lumine eventually fell to the clutches of the abyss. 
In the story, the crowd heir was deceived and the memory of her noble origins faded. She now believed that she was the queen of the Kingdom of Darkness, which could be a hint to the loom of fate. I made a video before on how the Abyss sibling was trapped by the threads of fate, thus inevitably tying her origins to the Vat and registering her into the Ermine Soul. And that theory follows up here. I'll be expanding on those arguments from that video, but essentially, I believe that this scene ties into the Abyss changing Lumine's history, voluntary or otherwise. However, unlike the story of the Battle Pass, the amount of Lumine's original fate that was overridden is still unknown. She still remembers Aether and the fact that she was stopped by the Sustainer of Heavenly Principles, but I don't know if she remembers coming from a place before Conria, or if to her, her time staying with Piera was the earliest of her accessible memories. That's what we don't know about. So let's dive into the deeper concept of the Luma Fate. For a more in-depth video on the background, I covered it in the Lumine video, so I'll be summarizing it instead here. The Luma Fate prior to the 3.5 Archon Quest was known as the operation to mechanize the god Asile with the corrupted power of the Statue of the Seven. This was in the 1.4 Archon Quest, but the ultimate lore of it is unknown. However, the Lumas theorized to be connected to the concept of reweaving the threads of fate and changing destiny as a loom is a kind of machine for weaving cloth. The Traveler is theorized to have the power to reweave fate, as said by Dane Sweep in the Devat trailer for the Arkhan quests. But now, we have a much more concrete explanation for the loom of fate. Clother says that Kyriber was able to weave his own destiny anew with the power of the Abyss. Clother says that Kyriber became the loom of fate, but I don't think that's completely accurate. Or at least, that the Loom of Fate is synonymous only with Kyriber. I believe that Kyriber himself alone isn't the Loom of Fate in all of its entirety, but rather, the Loom of Fate is an umbrella term to define both the people that are able to weave their fates and the mysterious power of the Divine that allows them to do so. It would make sense, though, why Clother would call Kyriber THE Loom of Fate, because this is the first time he's ever witnessed something like this, and this is the first time that title will be assigned to that kind of phenomenon. But I don't think that Kyriber himself is the the complete loom of fate, just the byproduct of it. And I also believe that the more the order grows and hardens the power of the abyss, turning into lectors and heralds that sing praises, they eventually, soon enough, become one with the loom of fate. The Arkhan Quest ends with a fascinating realization that the curse of immortality can be cleansed, and that there's something bigger lurking in the shadows, thus leading us to the final scene of the battle pass where we cut to the second crowned heir. And that's my personal analysis of the Battle Pass cutscene with the new information we have from 3.5. Some final notes that I do want to point out. One is a complete reading and reinterpretation of the Battle Pass cutscene should always be considered with a grain of salt, because the amount of fabrication Venti could be doing on the story is unknown. Two is that I do think there's a physical Genesis Pearl that exists somewhere in this world, but we have yet to see actual proof of that. Three is that I am just so happy to finally get this video off my chest because I have been cooking this video for months on end. Though I will be making an alternative reading on the Battle Pass where instead of Conria being the kingdom, I'm going to try to disprove my own argument from the very beginning of this video and say that the kingdom is Celestia. So we're going to dive in what's the possible changes that could happen in the story that it was Celestia that sent Lumine to the kingdom of darkness which would be Conria. What would actually change because there's a lot of things that could change with the symbolism. But with that, my name is Austin. Thank you for chilling with me. 